Matthew chapter number one, when they drew near unto, verse one, Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any man say all unto you, you shall say the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king comes to you, meek, sitting upon a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. Disciples went, did as Jesus commanded, and as they brought the donkey, the coat, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and put them in the way. The multitudes that went before verse 9 and that followed crying, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so here is this man on this Sunday going into Jerusalem. And as he comes into Jerusalem, the people just spontaneously broke out into praise. And, and the praise that they broke out into actually translates, here comes the Messiah. In Zechariah 9, 9, it had been prophesied that the Messiah was coming. And when he comes, he's going to come in humble, on a, riding on a donkey. And here is this man coming, humble, riding on a donkey. They break out in spontaneous praise. And when they break out in praise, they begin to say, he's the son of God. Here comes the Messiah. And so what we call it is Palm Sunday. And so Palm Sunday uh, is really, really important uh, to our faith because it kicks off Holy Week. Um, I don't understand why we don't have the excitement that we ought to have, not just on Easter, but the whole week leading up to it, because all of this means something, even to us today. It is speaking something to us today, and that's really what I'm excited about. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this that's coming into town riding on a donkey? And the people said, he's Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Um, for the next two Sundays, I want to teach from the subject, Sunday's Coming. And... I mean, boy, this is just, it's, it's just embedded in my spirit. Um, <laughs> some people are disappointed, discouraged, but I came today to remind you Sunday's coming. Some things you have buried. Some, some, things, some people have buried you. But... But, but what you need to know that Sunday's coming. So, so you can bury me all you want to, but Sunday's coming. You can talk about me all you want to, but Sunday's coming. I may be broke now, but Sunday's coming. I may not have all the things that I need to have, but Sunday's, Sunday's coming. Thank God. 
that Sundays. Coming. And so what are we going to do? Can we answer two questions? Two questions we're going to answer uh, today and, and, and in this series. Number one, how did Jesus spend his last days, or the last week rather, of his earthly ministry? How did he spend it? What did he do during this week? It's a good question. Second question, what can we learn from it? How did he spend it? And so what did he do? Why is that significant? And then what, what can we learn from it? So, so the first day was Sunday. And so what we just read, this happened on Sunday. And so Sunday, number one, Jesus entered into Jerusalem, humble and meek, riding on a donkey. And it had been prophesied in Zechariah that this is exactly what was going to happen. And so here comes Jesus. And the people began to sing praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be him that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They begin to praise as he's coming into Jerusalem. But the same people that's praising him now are the same people that's going to say, crucify him before the week is out. So the same people that's strolling and, 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 and putting palm leaves and, and throwing that, they are celebrating and praising the Messiah are the same people that said, we want Barabbas. And I want you to crucify this man. So pastor, what can we learn from uh, this thing right here, number one, stay humble. <laughs> He's the Messiah. You don't get higher than God. And here is the Messiah coming in, and as people are praising him, he comes in humble. So no matter what you're dealing with, no matter... <laughs> How much success you have had, stay humble. Number two, what can we learn? Don't allow praise to go to your head. Church, we can't allow praise to go to our head. I, I, so, so, so when folk praise you, stay humble. Because the same people that's praising you today will be saying, let's cut him next week. And so I cannot allow praise to go to my, to go to my head. So on Sunday, Jesus enters into Jerusalem, and he comes into Jerusalem as the Messiah. Number two, so, so Monday, what happened Monday, Pastor? Well, Monday, uh, you're, in, you're in Matthew chapter 21. So on Monday, Jesus curses a fig tree. And then he cleans out the temple. <laughs> and so in, in, in Matthew chapter 21, when you get there, say a, amen. And so, so as soon as he gets here, um, in verse 19, he saw a fig tree in the way. And he came to it, found nothing thereon, and said, let no fruit grow on you henceforth forever. And presently... The fig tree withered away. Pastor, why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Because it didn't have any figs on it. But it looked like it did. <laughs> So, so let me just stick to my notes. So, so what can we learn? Um, God is patient, but he expects fruit. He's a patient God, but he didn't send you here for nothing. As a matter of fact, God don't even want what he gave you back. He wants it multiplied. 
What he told Adam was, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, don't just give me what I gave you. But there ought to be, there, because I am in you, then you ought to be very fruitful. And so some folk look good on the outside. It ain't the outside that he's looking for. I don't care how you look on the outside. What's important, what's on the inside? What's on the inside is more important than how I look on the outside. We good at looking up and dressing up on the outside, but that ain't what he's looking at. When, when Samuel was looking for a king, he was looking on the outside. God said, no, you don't need to look on the outside. That ain't the king, that ain't the king, that ain't the king. The youngest one, the little boy right here, that's the king. I don't look at the outside. I look at the heart. And so when he's inspecting fruit, he ain't concerned about how you look on the outside. He's concerned about what's on the, what's on the inside. And so Monday, he's looking for fruit. And then he goes to church. And when he goes to church, the folk who are running the church have lost their way. Because this, ain't, this is not my father's house intention. What y'all doing have nothing to do with my father. And so he goes into the temple in verse 12. The Bible says he cast all of them out that sold and bought in the temple. Over through tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. So I want people to stop thinking about Jesus as this effeminate looking man that, that, that with pale skin and long hair. That, that's just humble, mild, meek, don't, you know, don't mess with them. No, no, no. This man walks into a church, a temple, and throws over the money tables and kicks them out. You can't kick nobody out being weak. <laughs> we, we, we miss that in Scripture. He walked in the church and kicked them out. As a matter of fact, he took a whip. Be because he was upset because they were cheating. It wasn't the buying and the selling. It was the cheating. Pastor, how do you know that? Look at what he said. He said, it's written. Well, who did he overthrow the tables of who? The money changers. So they cheating the people on the money. So, so you bring me $100 worth of weight and my scale, I've, I've manipulated my scale. So, so you, you bring me $100 of weight, but on my scale it says 95. So I, add, I, I get you to add five more pounds to get to 100. So now I've just cheated you out of five. I'm, I'm going to keep that for myself. So that's called stealing. And people that steal are called thieves. And so Jesus said, it, shall, it is written, verse 13, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it, what? A den of thieves. And so, so yeah, can you sell t-shirts at, at church? Yeah, just don't cheat people. So I've, I've had people say, Pastor, I had to leave your church because y'all sold CDs and tapes of the sermon. Y'all buying and selling in the church. Jesus don't like that. I say, brother, you really need to study this. Let's understand what is happening here. How, you know how many churches have been built with plate lunches? Y'all better say amen. You, you. <laughs> so it ain't got nothing to do with buying and selling. It's just about cheating, taking advantage of people. 
Uh, this wasn't in my notes, but it's just coming across. If you got a business and you're trying to do business with people in the church and that, those are your connections, you better not cheat them. I, I didn't say don't charge them and make a profit. Being in business, the, the word business, it, it means making a profit. If, if you don't make a profit, you ain't going to be in business. But you don't cheat folk. Don't, don't, don't advertise a service that you don't perform. And then charge for the service that you didn't perform. And, and that's what Jesus is saying here. And so, so, so what can we learn? Uh, the church belongs to God and not man. The church will always belong to God. Upon this rock, I will build... My church and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. So, so it's, it's Monday now. And so on Tuesday, what happens uh, on Tuesday? I like what happened on Tuesday because Tuesday, uh, Jesus retreats to the Mount of Olives. And when he retreats to the Mount of Olives, uh, it's not multitudes around him. He's just with his disciples. And as he's with his disciples on the Mount of Olives on Tuesday, he begins to prophesy about the destruction of Jerusalem. They were marveling about the temple and how great the temple was. And Jesus said, there will not be one stone that will be left unturned. This, this temple, the uh, entire city is going to be destroyed. And so he prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and his second coming. That's found in Matthew chapter 24. Y'all turn there real quick. Uh, Matthew 24. This is Tuesday. He went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of you coming and the end of the world? I'm going to just read some of this. Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Can I just stop right there? Let's, let Church, the world should not scare us at all. Let's stop being scared of the world. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say it like I'm from color. Stop being scared. S-C-E-A-D. It might be S-C-E-D. Stop being scared. And the way we said it, if you're scared, run. But the church ought not to be scared of what's happening in the world because he already told us. Then he said, don't be troubled. So why are we troubled? The reason that folk don't want your Jesus is because they don't think your Jesus can do anything. Because they're looking at you. You trembling the way they trembling. You posting the same thing they post. You having the same pity party that they have. But you are blood bought. You've been saved by the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. You come to church every Sunday. And you still scared. You still trouble. How we going to get people to love God when we scared when something happens in his kingdom? He said, all these things have to happen. But the end, the end is not yet. Nations shall rise against nations. Kingdom against kingdom. Famines, you're going to see pestilences. You're going to see earthquakes in different places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Right? 
Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Listen, Christian church posting things online. Think it not strange that people don't like you. We are supposed to be persecuted. We are supposed to be hated of nations. Listen, that's, that's not something to be alarmed by. That's what Jesus said. So it, um, it amazes me listening to preachers who are saying they don't, they're against Christianity. Yes, they are. They've been against Christianity. That don't mean anything. What does that have to do with your assignment? They've been against us. They was against Jesus. Do you see what they did to our Savior? So what makes you think you exempt? If they did that to Jesus, they going to do that to you. And so why are we uh, 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 shocked by that and complaining about it? I, I really wonder where we are right now. And, and, and I'm not really, I'm not concerned about the world. I'm concerned about the church. Like, where are we? Where is all this stuff coming from? So it's Tuesday. And he retreats uh, to the Mount of Olives. And he begins to, to share this. And, um, listen to this. He said, many false prophets shall arise, shall deceive many. Because iniquity uh, shall abound, seeing the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Verse 15 is important. And I'm going to just say it. Um, it. It would take me too long to explain the whole thing. But uh, the abomination of desolation, verse 15, uh, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso read it, uh, let him understand. In other words, this is the Antichrist. Yeah. Jesus is now talking about the Antichrist. He revealed that to Daniel. Yeah. It's also in Revelation. And so when one day uh, the Antichrist is going to stand in the temple, not in the church, but in the temple, in the Jewish temple, and he's going to declare that he's God. And when he declares that he's God, that's when finally the Jews' eyes will be opened because now he's blasphemed. And so that's what, when Jesus says, when you see that, then that's when you need to flee. That's when you need to run. Okay? Uh, but the church will be gone. So y'all ain't got to worry about that. Are you saved? So you will already be raptured. So, so, so this is in the tribulation. All right, so, 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 so this, is, this is Tuesday. Uh, this is also the day that Judas uh, betrayed him. That's when he agreed to betray him. This was on Tuesday. And, and, and it's important uh, because what we can learn from it is uh, we can trust the Scripture. We can trust the scripture. Amen. Um, what did Jesus say? He said there won't be a stone left. This city, this temple is going to be destroyed. In 70 AD, a general by the name of Titus, a Roman general who ended up, uh, ended up being uh, the emperor, uh, went into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, desolated the city. And so, so Jesus had told them that this was going to happen. Zechariah told the people that Jesus was going to come in on a, a donkey. 
That's called prophecy. Right. Only God can prophesy precisely Amen. and never miss. Amen. So, so, Pastor, how do you know? And people say, well, how do you know you can believe the Bible? Because everything he said in it has happened. Everything he said has happened. And I'm a witness because in Rome, uh, there is an arch that they built, an arch that they built called the Arch of Titus. And I was privileged enough, uh, and my wife and I, uh, to actually go to this arch. And this is the Arch of Titus. And what Rome did to celebrate or to commemorate uh, Titus uh, sacking uh, Jerusalem and plundering the temple, they erected this arch. And so even today, Jewish people won't go under it. They won't walk through it because if you look closely, uh, and there's a picture that shows a close-up close of this, if y'all can see that. Uh, he's, they're, they're taking uh, precious things out of the temple. They're taking all of the, the, uh, the, uh, the riches and the gold and all the silver, all of the religious artifacts, they're taking those out of the temple. And so this arch commemorates that. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And so, and, and, and by the way, uh, this is my own camera. You know how Paul said, I, took the, I wrote this with my own hand? <laughs> I took this picture with my own camera. And so, so, so it just, it, I didn't know at the time when I was taking the picture that it would be validating a sermon that I'm preaching today. So if, if he said that and it's true, and if he, if he, if he prophesied, that, that, that this is true, what about his second coming? All right. All right. Yeah. There are some folk that don't believe yes, that he's coming back. Right. But if he said that and it's true, yeah. Yeah. then if he said he's coming back, that has to be true too. Yeah. And so everything that he said has happened. Yeah. 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 He prophesied all of those things and they happened so to the folk who wonder, is Jesus really the Son of God? Can I really, uh, can, can I really believe what the Bible says? Everything he said is true. Everything that he said happened. Amen. What side do you? Okay. If somebody's batting a thousand and they never miss, are you going to take your chances? That he's been right every time, but he's going to be wrong about this? I, I mean, my brain don't function that way. I got saved because if I didn't get saved because I love the Lord. I hate to say that. That ain't why I got saved. I got saved to keep from going to hell. The way they explain hell to me, I ain't going. So what I got to do? <laughs> What do I have to do to keep from going there? That's what got me saved. But then once I got saved, once I got to know him, once, once I got to walk with him and talk with him and spend time with him, I fell in love with him. I ain't going nowhere. My soul is anchored in the Lord. <laughs> Going nowhere now. I love him. I'll die for it. Won't just live for it. I'll die for it. Spend the rest of my life serving. And so, uh, did I give you your second point? So we can trust the scriptures. Everything that he said would happen has happened. Everything that he said would happen has happened. And then doing right does not exempt us from betrayal. Amen. <laughs> uh, and, and I think we need to actually, I need to, we need to actually read this scripture. Y'all in, in 24, 
Go, go to 26, Matthew uh, 26. Uh, look at verse uh, 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests, said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted, covenanted with him or agreed with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he saw opportunity to betray him. And so what can we learn from that? Even when you're doing right, it does not exempt you from being betrayed. We get mad at God because I was doing everything right. Anybody ever been here? I'm living right. Lord, I'm tithing now. I'm singing in the choir. And how can this, how did I get laid up? How are my coworkers? They are after me. They, they stabbing me in the back. So, so even when you're doing right, it doesn't exempt us from being betrayed. It does not exempt us from being betrayed. So we can learn that. Because here's Jesus doing everything right, but one of his inner circle guys behind his back, you're going to sneak to the Pharisees, and, and, and what he said, and church, I want y'all to get this revelation. You can turn on Christian re uh, television and on some Christian channels. This is exactly how it sounds. You give me money, and I'll give you Jesus. You buy my oil. You buy my water. You buy my book. You give me money, and I'll give you Jesus. When Jesus said, freely, you have received, freely, Judah said, give me money, <laughs> and I'll give you Jesus. Wednesday, nothing's recorded. Silent day. I believe he, Jesus uh, went to Bible study at Antioch Christian Church. Because he's always welcome here on Wednesday. <laughs> Amen. And so, so Wednesday, Wednesday was silent, but then Thursday. Um, Thursday was a big day. I don't even have time. I got one minute and 36 seconds to, to talk about uh, <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> so Thursday, a whole lot happened. Now, Thursday um, was the day before the Passover. And so Passover was Friday, 14th day of the sun on the Jewish calendar, or the 15th day of the sun. And so, so, so Thursday, uh, you prepared for the Passover. And so what happened on Thursday, see, Pastor T, I wish I had time to really preach this. Thursday, what we call the Last Supper, was supposed to happen Friday. But Jesus knew that we got to do it tonight because I ain't going to be, I'm going to be doing something else Friday. <laughs> I got plans Friday. And so, so we got to do this Thursday. And so on Thursday is, is, is when he observes the Passover uh, with his disciples. You in Matthew 26 and so look at verse uh, 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where will we, where would you that we prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city, uh, find a man, say unto him, the master said, my time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at your house and with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus said, and or had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. So uh, when the even was come, he sat down with the 12, um, and as he ate, he said, Some, one of y'all going to betray me. <laughs> um, wow. He, this is what gets me about this whole, studying this whole thing you know, the last few weeks is he knew everything that was going to happen.
How many of us, knowing that somebody's going to betray us, would still have dinner with us? Well, y'all, I, I, we thinking, we really thinking about this. I mean, think about it. I, he, he knew all this was going on. Judas is in that room. This is Thursday. Jesus knows exactly what's about to happen. And then he does something else. He not only has Passover with them, when he finished having Passover, he got up and washed their feet. This is on Thursday. And so he washed their feet and including Judas. Judas had already betrayed him. He was just waiting on the right time to bring in the arresters, the Pharisees. And so, 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 so what Jesus does is he said this to his disciples with desire, I have longed to have this Passover with you. Then this is where we get our communion from. He says, this is my body. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. I want y'all to understand that the Old Testament is just a shadow of what the New Testament revealed. And so as they ate the Passover lamb, you ain't going to eat, you're not going to eat a lamb lamb. You're going to eat the lamb lamb. I am the lamb of God. And so I am the bread of life. What's going to keep you alive is the bread of life, not the Passover lamb. Got to eat that every year. <laughs> it's a tone. Amen. Amen. And so, so, so he's, he washes their feet. He eats the Passover with them. And right after he ate the Passover, and I could, it's just too much for me to, to go through uh, in one message, but y'all know we're going to pick this up. But this the same night that he went, after they ate the Passover, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's when he began to pray. And the famous verse, Lord, if you're willing, take this cup. This one right here. Take, take this one because, you know, we've always been together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've never been separated. And, and, and so I know what our plan is to redeem mankind and you know, I don't have a problem with the thorns. I don't have a problem with the betrayal. I don't have a problem with the denial. I don't have a problem uh, with the beatings and, 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 and all of that being spit on. I, I don't have a problem with any of that. What I have a problem with is when you're going to have to turn your back and we're going to be separated for the first time. That's what I have a problem with. So, Lord, if it's any way possible, take this cup and let it pass me, but nevertheless, not my will, but but your will, your will be done. Got on the disciples because they went to sleep. They were tired. It had been a long day. And he said, y'all couldn't wait, couldn't watch for one hour. In church, We sleep when it's prayer time. But we we'll awake when the miracles start coming. Have a prayer service and see how many, how many believers show up. I'm asleep. But when you open eyes, when you feed 5,000 men, <laughs> when you walk on water, when you're when you stopping storms, when, you, when you're raising the dead, we right there. We wide awake. And so 
What can we learn? And this is so important. Um, spend, uh, cherish every moment with loved ones. Jesus knew this the last time. On this, this side, we're going to be able to spend time together. We're going to eat this Passover. And so cherish every moment with your loved one. Because you don't know when it's the last time. And so you cherish that. My daughter's coming home for Easter. And she said, uh, I miss Antioch. And it's coming to church. So she's flying her and my grandson all the way from uh, New York just to spend Easter with her family. And so we done cleared our calendar. We ain't meeting with nobody, ain't going nowhere, because I'm going to cherish that time that I have with my daughter and my grandson. So we got to cherish those moments. Jesus cherished that moment. It's important. Amen. Don't take it for granted Amen. that I'll see him next week. You don't know that. Amen. Take advantage of the time. Amen. Uh, now, and then the next thing we can learn uh, is forgiveness is greater than vengeance. Amen. Forgiveness is greater than vengeance. We still trying to get people back that has wronged us. Jesus washed his feet. Forgiveness is greater than vengeance. And so I need to forgive people that wronged me. Nobody's treated you the way they treated Jesus. And then we forget how we treated Jesus. He didn't get revenge on us. He forgave us because forgiveness is greater uh, than, than vengeance. And then finally, um, Friday, um, he was brought before Pilate. Um, he was tried, uh, and he was, he was crucified. Um, he dies at 3 p.m. And, Pastor, why is that relevant? Why is that important? Because um, he, he couldn't hang on the cross. It would have been blasphemous or sacrilegious for anybody to stay on the cross when the Sabbath, uh, the, uh, the Passover began. And so he had to come off the cross before sundown. But here's something that's interesting. The Bible says at 12 o'clock, the sun stopped shining. <laughs> I'm saying, we, you know, we got eclipse coming up, right? And so, so here, you know, you don't black the sun out at 12 o'clock. And everything's normal. So, so at 12, it got dark. And so you think about how long Jesus hung on the cross. And so the Bible says about the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock, that's when he gave up the ghost. So he was hanging there, and the Bible says, uh, uh, he that knew no sin became sin. And he did not say anything until he became sin. And once he became sin, he said these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It got dark because God had to leave him. And so that had never happened before. So we're experiencing something and seeing something that has never happened before and will never happen again. And so when it got dark, that's when he became sin. God can't fellowship with sin. God has nothing to do with sin. So, so, so God is separate from sin, and so the Father had to leave the Son on the cross. And the Bible says he gave up the goat. At 3 p.m. And when he gave up the ghost, 
whole lot of things happen. Uh, the old preacher said this way, and I like it, almost said, every year I, I can. The reason the sun stopped shining, shining is because two suns can't shine at the same time. So it was time for the S-U-N to be quiet, and it was time for the S-O-N to shine. And so, 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 <laughs> so he died, 3 o'clock. And I need the super spiritual people to tell me. He died, and then he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And so I want y'all, the, the super spiritual folks, why was he buried in a borrowed tomb? Oh, boy, y'all are sharp. Y'all are sharp. When you borrow something, When you borrow something, you plan on giving it back. When, when you borrow something, that means you don't need it long. <laughs> and so he was buried in a borrowed tomb because they ain't going to need it long. I'm going to give it back to you. Amen. And, and so what can we learn? What we can learn from this is that Sundays come. And so while everybody's sad, Sunday's coming. While everybody's upset, Sunday's coming. While everybody has counted you out, Sunday's coming. Folk that have betrayed you, Sunday is coming. My friends have scattered, but Sunday's coming. My children ain't acting right, Sunday's coming. My family is broken up, Sunday's coming. They laid me off, Sunday's coming. Y'all thought I was done, Sunday's coming. Y'all thought I was dead, Sunday's coming. Y'all thought they had buried me, Sunday's. Sunday's coming. So this week you tell somebody, when they tell you how bad things are, you just tell them Sunday's coming. Just tell them Sunday. Sunday's coming. The Bible says for the joy that was set before. See, Jesus knew he endured the cross. He knew that Sunday was coming. And I, oh, I can't wait to Sunday this morning. This Sunday is coming. And when Sunday came, we're going to find out, what did he do? We are, we are what day now? Friday. So we got to learn next Sunday, what did he do Saturday? <laughs> because on the cross... He say it is finished. In other words, what I was sitting here to do, God, I did all you told me to do. I surrendered everything that you asked me to surrender. And now I got the thief on the cross say it is finished. You know what he didn't say? I am finished. So when he gave up the ghost, he went somewhere. Because it was finished, but I wouldn't. There's something that belonged to me that I got to go get. There's some folk that's been waiting on me that I got to go get. I've got some faithful servants that have been serving me and waiting on me, and I Got to go get him. And just like he went and got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Moses, just like he went and got them, he's going to come back and get you. When it's time, the trumpet is going to sound. And when the trumpet sound, the Bible said, the dead in Christ shall rise again. And they that are alive and remain shall be caught up and there we will forever be with the Lord. Tell somebody Sunday's coming. Come on, my time is up and I... <laughs> Y'all can see why I'm excited about this. <laughs>